Thank you very much, um, Rosalind, uh, for a fascinating film. Um, uh, just to uh, say to all of you here what we've planned, we plan uh, just to have a, a conversation uh, around a couple of topics that we've uh, drawn up, but we might digress, we might improvise, we might do anything. Uh, and so we'll talk for about 25, 30 minutes, and uh, then we hope that you'll all want to have uh, join in and make comments and ask Rosalind questions. Uh, now, you started by uh, explaining how the film had come into into existence. I just wondered if there was anything else that you wanted to add uh, as an introduction about uh, Vivian and Elizabeth. Um, when you first met them, you said you went there three times. Mm. Um, did you feel you actually got to know them, or were they rather opaque as characters? Well, when I arrived uh, off the plane, Vivian came to, had come to Guatemala City to meet me with a taxi. And she'd done some shopping during the day. She'd got her canvas and some things that she can only get in Guatemala City. Yeah. And she drove back with me that night. And when I told her I hadn't brought my camera or anything, she burst out laughing, but it was sort of nervous laugh. Cause I think she wondered what the hell you were doing I was going to do yeah. if I wasn't going to. So and it sort of started off with this kind of, oh, uh, well, here's this woman who's making a film, but she isn't making a film. She's just going to spend time with us. And um, so there was that like moment. And then when I arrived that night, after having traveling for two days, I immediately met a scorpion in the sink. And <laughs> that kind of broke the ice completely. So there was that, you know, she came with a box and took this scorpion away. And you know, it was, it was just like, oh, this is great. This is going to be brilliant. I've already done that, you know, and I just felt, I guess it was quite quick that I just felt this way of being, which was, um, uh, she is a somewhat nervous person, but at the same time, extremely relaxed. She's absolutely in her own, mm. in mm. her own world. And I don't mean mm. that she's absent. I mean, she's just rooted within that world that she's created around herself and her mother. Yeah. And so there is this sense of comfort and time there. Um, and I felt quite quickly that I could, um, there were a lot of things that I wanted to know about it, or I wanted to be able to not know. I, I felt that like I already knew just by experiencing them, but I wanted to know how to express them to other people. Mm, mm. So I, um, I just, we just spent um, five or six or seven days, I can't remember what it was, sitting in the garden and talking, and um, we had a lot to discuss, you know. And um, it felt very natural. And afterwards, she sort of said, well, you know, we thought it was a bit strange that you came without the camera, but we were glad of it in the end. And it just meant that when I came back, which was several months later, I think I went in the sort of winter and I came back in the early summer the next year, I knew things that had happened that would be crucial to the film, but I couldn't have captured while they were happening. So then I could yeah. go and sort of make them happen again. Yes, exactly. And Can I just interrupt for yeah. a very quick question? Why are they living in Guatemala? Um, well, the story goes back, I suppose, to when Elizabeth was born. Uh, well, sorry, was a young girl. Oh, yeah. Um, she was uh, in Vienna, she's from Vienna, yes. from a very kind of well-to-do family. And um, I think her grandfather was an advisor to the emperor or something back in the time. And um, sh they fled the Nazis. Her father was Jewish, her mother was not. And they fled the Nazis when uh, Elizabeth was 16. She was Ice. an only child with her parents. And they went to Argentina. Ice. So in a way, there was already that connection yes. with Latin yeah. America. Yeah. Yeah. And then when uh, her mother then married a Swiss from Basel and had Vivian there, and then they left Argentina due again to the political situation, but in very different circumstances, 
um, when Vivian was 13. And so then they were living in Basel in Switzerland. Vivian then married and quite young and when she was 30 divorced and didn't have any children and was kind of quite lost at that time and went um, to LA see friends, didn't like LA and hitchhiked down to Guatemala, visited mm. Pan Hotel and decided to stay there. I fell in love with the lake, Getitlan. Yes. I think in actually she was told you shouldn't go back on the bus tonight because there's bandits, which there are bandits yes. that hijack the buses quite regularly. I guess this is in the eighties maybe. Anyway, she stayed that night and woke up and saw the lake and just had one of those moments and decided uh -huh. to stay. And then, and then the elder, when the mother became her elderly mother. and yes. widowed, um, she joined her. Yes. Built another house for the mother, <coughs> yeah, and um, joined her. <coughs> and then you called it Vivian's Garden. Is there any metaphoric significance to Vivian's Garden? Is, does it refer to her and what you called her absentness? Um, uh, or. I suppose it's the universe. A garden is a kind of created universe, isn't mm. it? It's not really, it's not a wild place, and yet it is an, a nature sort of place. So it's got that paradox of yes. it, um, that it's a created world. Um, yeah. But I was, you know, it, it feels like it's the jungle, but it's a garden that Vivian's grown over 30 years. Uh. So. You know, yes. they're actually in a small town outside the gate, but I mean, they never really go outside, outside. the gate. Yes. So, yes. Um, it's and one of the other things I want to ask you about, actually, the making of the film was how uh, did you uh, uh, stage certain scenes? Yes, yeah, um, I did. I staged scenes which I wanted to have in the film, which I mm. couldn't capture otherwise. So I which staged ones? the. Um, banana leaves over the skylight when Vivian was yes. in bed. Yes. And because that had happened when I had gone the first time, I had a discussion with Vivian about that. The first or the second time, actually, I can't remember, where she'd said, it must have been the second time, because I was loading some film, and I needed darkness, and there were skylights everywhere. And she said, well, Don Tomar can put banana leaves on the skylight. He does that to me when I'm sick and I s need to sleep, he'll put the banana leaves on the roof. Um, and that struck me as quite a sort of succinct way of describing this care, which is about, which is sort of love, which is to do with the body, that I felt could be described as a mother love, even though it was coming from a man who they were paying to mm. do it, mm. because that kind of care, which doesn't really treat you as an individual, but treats you as a body, you know, is like a mother love in a sense. And so I wanted to show that change in atmosphere, change in light, um, and gesture of care for, yes. for the body. So I, I did do that several times. <laughs> and what about the scene with the clothes? Also, also I staged yeah. that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was more to, in a way, uh, it's my life, you know, it's my way, it's one of the ways that I have related to my mother, I suppose, uh, discussing, you know, these things when I was younger, talking about clothes and what to take and what to wear, and, mm -hmm. and I also saw that in Vivian's way with me and her way with her mother, and I just thought that that would be a way to bring out their relationship and then of course the conversation wasn't in any way staged mm. I mean it was begun by me but it was taken by them where they wanted to take it and, and they carried on Vivian yeah. was going away so she was genuinely going yeah, away. yeah and she had asked me actually now it comes back to me she'd asked me to help her yeah decide what to take uh -huh. and she wasn't going away for quite a long time she had asked yes. me to go through her clothes with her and I said well why don't we do that with yes. your mother and we film it mm. Mm. and that's why I suppose at one point her mother says you know you don't have to take them in the end and Vivian said no I really want to know <laughs> what you think <laughs> you know yeah. and I'm, so mm. there was everything yeah. that was staged was just a way of you know telling bringing out something in their particular yeah. relationship yeah relationship their environment. I wanted to ask you about the space, because um, clearly this 
space of the garden, the space of the garden, the space of the house, almost seem to kind of merge together at certain points. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but the space obviously is internal. There's a lot of emphasis on enclosure. Um, I thought it was very interesting that you introduced the garden and the house through uh, the um, Mayan servant coming in. So he comes in from the outside, so you've got a very strong sense of the difference between the outside and the inside with the gate. And, uh, and then you filmed him going almost labyrinthine around the paths. Mm. I wondered, uh, before we think about the significance of the, of the space, about those shots of him coming in because it seems to be quite thought through that you wanted to have that yeah. sense of entrance. Yeah, well, I just, I felt like um, I wanted to visually tell, lay out, yes, the circumstances, that there are two houses within one quite wild plot of land and mm. that they do have their own spaces, but that they're interlinked and porous and those people, they and others, go between them. And so, you know, I just, I didn't, I decided early on that it wasn't going to be my role to tell the story of Elizabeth fleeing the Nazis and mm. what happened, but it was my role to sort of try to portray this world that they had. And there were certain things I just had, felt I had to get through in the best way I could. And I felt that Don Tomar was the one who went out and goes to the market, mm. or Juan, the younger guy. Mm. Um, and is the go-between with the inside world and the outside world. So to just have bring him in and have him pass through the mother's house and then to the mm. daughter's house, which is quite a common occurrence, was the way to do that, to yes. sketch out the, yes. the, the place where you're in. And that's kind of, you know, a, a very um, ordinary way of establishing yes. space in a film, as you know. So it's just like establishing where you are. Um, and in a way, I sort of, sometimes I feel that those shots, which are set shots in a way, um, are quite different language than some of the other shots, which are just quite static, and they mm. describe things with a very different mood. And in yes. fact, there are two camera people. One is me, yes. and the other one is Emma Dalesman. Yes. And um, in this film, I kind of, um, I had Emma shoot all the things that I really wanted to sort of give you a sense of the physical properties or the mathematics of mm. something that could be laid out, whether mm. it be a conversation or a moving through. And I did the bits that were more going into certain scenes or situations mm. or objects or images yes. or plants or whatever it may be. Yes, yes. We'll come back to that in a moment. But I mean, I had the sense that although it's what one could say, kind of going back to Julia Kristeva or whoever, that it's um, an enclosed, maternal, um, protected space. There's also a sense that they're embattled. They're, they talk about being scared. Mm. And then there's quite a complicated anecdote about someone who was in bad company and possibly taking cocaine. Mm. Um, and and the, the sense that the outside world has a threatening side to yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I... So I thought there were two sides. There that is. There is exactly, that's exactly right. There's this sort of... I mean, the immediate thing that I felt when going there was this is like a magical... This is a healing place. Mm. This is this wonderful situation. But there's always this other side, which was terror, mm. in a way. Mm. And it's their terror at what they'd been through, where they'd been, they'd had this sort of menacing, sort of sometimes criminal neighbor who had set a curfew on them at one point mm -hmm. and um, controlled at one point the access to their house um, and was th at that time in prison. And also they'd had terrible damage from floods, uh, Hurricane Stan. Uh, yes. with it, which they'd had to which be rescued from, and I they see. were lost a dog, and they, 
lost, uh, you know, all of... It, it actually did provoke a huge change in Vivian's work because a lot of her work got destroyed, but she still shows mm. that destroyed work. So um, that was a devastating thing that happened to them. But um, And then there was the everyday scorpions and snakes. So, you know, there was yes. just... Yes. There was always that side. Yes. And I think um, it's a bit like that um, Michael Tossig book, um, is it Colonialism, Shamanism, The Wild Man, uh, which yes, is the I first know. part is terror and the second part is healing. Uh, and I really felt like that would be a way, mm. that would be the way that I needed to... Um, <clears throat> these were the two things I needed to get across, mm. you know, without imposing my own narrative yes. over. Yes, and I think that comes across very, very, very vividly. But then uh, a moment ago, you mentioned the shots that you wanted to do yourself. And I wondered how much that had to do with the very remarkable texture of the film, the actual sense of light, shade, color, mm. um, and, and actually, literally, physical texture of things. Yeah, well, I think um, between... I'm sorry to interrupt, but so were those the kinds of shots that you actually planned and did yourself? Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, I think they were. Yeah, I, um, it was between her painting, Elizabeth's collages, the garden, the things that they had in the house, the way that they that Vivian collected things, that she would have a green uh, lace curtain against mm. a sort of um, Pompeii red or terracotta yes. wall. Or th these things were really striking and they were really more than just nice decoration. They were mm. her. It was mm. her character. You know, it was, it was her. And so for instance, there's the red wall with the red flowers. Exactly, in yeah. These things that carried so much of the emotion that was in the mm. house somehow. And she also talks about, although it's, again, it's fragmented, and um, she talks about having guests and then having to rearrange everything but to get back to how she was and mm. to sort of get away the sense of people being there. And the mother says, well, I asked my doctor about that. You know, and she has this strong connection. Her work is absolutely about her immediate surroundings, whether it be the garden or something she just heard on the news or dog or whatever so um yeah and the way that i again want to express to others through film is usually to try to pick up you know like look at something and figure out how it works like how is it why is it moving or interesting or terrifying or whatever it is so it's through that sort of looking through things or looking at the underside just kind of figuring out through the camera really um, and then there are those other kind of shots, as they say, where I just want to get everything, and that's like, get Don Tamar from here to here, or, you know, mm. and not... I, I, I use, when I'm shooting, I use my wind-up camera, and I have my at-on camera that Emma Dalesman uses, mm. Mm. which I can have sync sound, and it doesn't have that 28-second limit on yes. shots. Yeah. But I, I use my camera really just to bring these textures and details. And, and details. And, I mean, I didn't want this to sound too cliched, Rosalind, but is there, a, is there a feminine aesthetic there? A feminine aesthetic? Yes. In, in that interest in texture, colour, uh, moving light. I never thought about it that way. Um... I don't know. I don't know if that's a feminine thing. I, I do like to sort of take time, extra time to look. Mm. And I, I think that could be male, masculine and feminine thing to do. But I suppose there's a sort of passivity to it. Mm. But I do like to take that extra time to look at things when I've got the opportunity mm. and give that in the film as well. Um, extra time to look at something without actually doing really long shots. I mean, there's no shots in that that can possibly be longer than about 26 seconds. But you have the feeling of, like, the space and the extra time to go into something. Yes. But then there is also the sense of the actual... Sh some shots that are actually, like, shots. You know, just 
moments, things you've seen, mm. things that you want to pick out. And I think it's extremely interesting that you use the, what's it called, your camera? The Bolex. Uh, you used an old-fashioned yeah. Bolex. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, which has such an extraordinarily lo long history yeah. in experimental and avant-garde film. Um, whereas the Archon is more kind of glamorous 60s mm. thing. Um, but I wanted to ask you about what celluloid uh, that to certain, in, some, in some ways that to shoot now on 16 millimeter film seems to be almost consciously archaic. Uh, yeah, I, I got interested in 16mm film uh, through just doing a two-day workshop that was offered by the photography department at Glasgow School of Art when I was there. But I, I felt like it was something that I could control and get a handle on. And I still feel like that about it. But I suppose the reason that I continue, because I know now that there are, you know, these wonderful lenses and other ways of, you know, maybe getting to a similar result, but I still feel that the film has a, a liveliness in it that uh, other formats, mm. video and digital, don't have. And it's just, to me, feels actually less filtered than the digital um, medium. And the fact that it's just more mechanical and more... Uh, the actual shoot itself is a lot more, um, to me, in my experience, to do with my physical presence, measuring, you know, a bit of mathematics, setting up lights, knowing the lenses. It's just, it doesn't change, but it's always engrossing and, and very intense and mm. sort of... Mm -hmm means that I get very involved in what I'm doing. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, I guess there is that sort of containment to it as well. So on the one hand, there's the aesthetics of it that I prefer, and I think that it looks livelier. But on the other hand, there's the actual performance of the shoot itself that I find puts me and whoever else is around me more at ease, I think, mm -hmm. when I'm doing it. Yeah. And then what about editing? Editing, I do it on the computer, on, yes. you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, I usually edit myself and then I work with Lucy Harris, an editor, for, she'll come in for two or three days at some point <clears throat> and give it another eye, yes. but I edit digitally. Um, I wanted, just before we open it up, which we should do in a minute, uh, um, to just relate Vivian's Gardeners. That's um, the only film of yours that I've seen, though I've, uh, I know about others. Uh, to what extent might one understand it in terms of your work more generally? Mm. And the previous film you made was the Gaza one, mm. which seems to have, well, perhaps rather than me saying seems to have been, perhaps you could just talk a little bit about how your film work, um, how they, it fits together. And, um, mm. uh, um, right. So Electrical Gaza I made in 2015, and mm. this one was finished in 2017. Um, and there's a very interesting, uh, it, it's not an anecdote, but, but what you had in mind when you called the film electrical, electric, is yeah, it electric? electrical, electrical Gaza. Uh, and I th wondered if perhaps you could just start by explaining what yeah. that meant, because right. it was very striking. Well, when the, um, when, uh, I don't think what, any, what, what it was. Well, there are a few reasons I called it that, but I, I went to Gaza and I shot this film. Uh, I had to leave early because the war broke out, but I was um, struck when I was there by this strange atmosphere. Well, of course, there was a very charged atmosphere there. Um, mm. It's a place of where almost everybody is, or probably everybody is, psychologically damaged by w continued uh, warfare and um, there's this intensity of population and intensity of um, resistance and, and kind of together sort of militant feeling as well as factionism and it lends to the atmosphere this intense charge which is 
exciting, but also dangerous. Mm. And um, I called it electrical because of that air that sort of is charged and there is this mm. sense of excitement, but there's also a lack of fresh air, a lack of mm -hmm. something healthy and wholesome that you yeah. can breathe, you know. And, yeah, that was... Because uh, the, I, I, mean, I felt that in some ways, I mean, this might be just reading what they call, you know, reading too much into it, but that in both cases there was a sense of enclosure in pr and Vivian and Elizabeth, there's a sense of enclosure and imprisonment mm. um, and the sense of Gaza as this in enclosed place with gates and crossings mm. and the yeah. difficulty of getting in and out and what the out difference between the outside world and the inside world. Yeah. So I was thinking perhaps a little bit about connections like yeah. that. Yeah, that might, that might say more about me than, <laughs> <laughs> right. than uh, my um, Is there anything else you want to say? Shall we have a bit, is it possible to have a bit more light, Rose? I suppose I could say something, um, would like to say a bit about the sort of, the way that they live, which to our eyes might seem uh, disturbing, really, which is the kind of colonial and post-colonial aspect of, oh, of yes, it. Oh yes, I didn't, yeah. I was going to ask you a question about yes, that. Yes, yeah, yep. um, that's forgot. the only thing that we yep. didn't, um, mm. well, one of the things that we didn't discuss. Mm. Um, I thought, obviously I thought about that a lot, being there, and in, in different ways, the way in which they care for one another, and the way in which they have developed this small economy there. Um, and I thought about how I, as the filmmaker, could approach that situation of these kind of of these indigenous people looking after these European emigres mm. Mm. or exiles, depending how you look at it. And I, I even, you know, at some points I even tried to orchestrate situations where that would be confronted. And, um, and I did that in the shoot. And in the end, I actually felt that that was uh, a very clumsy thing to do, actually. And, uh, and it's all already there to me in the way that they live and work together, um, the complexity of the situation has to be appreciated yes. rather than resolved, I felt. Yeah. But um, it was we did have this sort of... Just to interrupt for a second, I mean, it was certainly dramatised when you juxtapose the two lunches. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, it's this sort of showing mm. and... Um, Allowing it to be what it is, is what I felt was important. Mm. And anyway, there's also an extraordinary sense of dependence. Yeah. That obviously Elizabeth and um, Vivian couldn't survive without Don... What's Toma. It? Don Toma and Juan. And, Juan. and, and Bertola. And yes, who we see in the kitchen. Francisca, yeah. 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 So there is these poor There's people who come and go, and mm. they're, this is the economy that I'm talking about. They're, they're paid by Elizabeth, who still mm. holds the purse, you know. So one saw. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the... I mean, mm. I think that it's sort of... It's, yeah, it's, it's mm. glaringly there, let's say. Um, we'd like to have some... Any comments or um, further questions to... Rosalind. Hello. Hi, um, very beautiful. Um, Helen, can you sorry, yes, talk? Course, I know you're perfectly capable of talking. Lots of kind of currents mm. kind of crossing underneath the surface, which I really enjoyed, um, and some of which were pleasurable, some of which were slightly more, um, had uh, more attention attached to them. But I wanted to ask you about Vivian as an artist. Mm. Um, what I was struck by was how her life and her work were one thing. 
And I think that that is why Adam asked me to go there in the first place, because he sensed that that was really important in her work, and he sensed that that was something that I could respond to in mine. And I, um, I brought her work in at the point during the music track, um, and I felt, I mean, I filmed that, her work in a very kind of involved way. I was, you know, very much taken with her work. Unfortunately, that moment, for some reason, it was glitching on the, you know, on the file. I don't know why. But, um, uh, yeah, I just didn't want... I just was really... I learned a lot from that experience about being an artist and being in a family and having a, like, normal working life as well and having a job and all that. I just took so much from it about how these things can, uh, can run alongside and inform each other and not be in conflict with each other. And I think that's probably changed the way I work. And I just, that was the thing that I wanted to put across. So I did not, you know, what I intended was there to be no separation really between her in the garden, in the house, and in, in the, the studio, which is out in the garden, if you see what I mean. Yeah, it was like this. It was like a little sort of cinema room, you know, a um, bit more slick, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So I showed this film uh, in both Athens and Castle in a room, dark with carpet and comfortable seating and a projection and screen and good sound system, and. Um, in the best, I, I felt, what would be the best way to see and hear it. Yeah. And were Elizabeth's and Vivian's work... Their work was there as well. Was there yeah. in the same sort of area? Not really, no. We made a decision to keep them quite, quite separate. far away. Yeah. Um, and I also had painting, which was in another place altogether, in a third place. Yeah. So Vivian and Elizabeth had their work close together. Mm. And, I was some, and I had my film in a, another place. Mm. my painting in another place so it was it could have worked differently I'm not sure in Chicago they're currently showing Vivian's work and my film so I'm not sure what they've done there actually in terms of the spacing mm. between the two it could have worked that they were together but we wanted it we, Adam and Vivian and I all felt that it would, w would be important for them to be individual works and mm. not seen as complimenting yes or yes or, or illustrating yeah. or something like that yes yeah Bonar. Well, you know, she did that. You know, that's what she did. I mean, I was just trying to show that. You know, that's the challenge of it. It's like it's all already there, but how do you, how do you get that across and not lose it in the process of making a film? Just keep it intact. Yeah. Um, I can't. Yes. Well, what Vivian thought of the film, she felt like she didn't like seeing herself from all angles, you know. But apart from that, she really enjoyed it. But she was it's a bit painful for her to see for herself from, you know, the way that maybe a lot of us would feel feel about that. And also at certain times, she said, "Why did I? Why did you make me say that?" <laughs> there were some things I scripted actually. But that was her initial response to me in a hotel room when we were looking at it. But then she was walking around in Athens and people were running up to her and saying, Vivian, you know, and talking to her. And <laughs> people had got this sense of who, who she, she was. Who she was, yes. 
And, um, so she was a bit of a star. She was a bit of a star, and she sort of felt that she knew... She feels, I think... affectionate to the film, and that it, it you know, she and her mother really felt that it, it was an important thing for them. And I saw her this summer, and she said that there was somebody around who wanted to make a film about her, and she just felt there was no point that no one could make a film like that, and that was done, and, you oh, know, that's, you know. That's, so I think that she yes. does feel... Fun. But yeah, to be honest, the initial feeling was that sort of, <coughs> you know, I'm, I'm not 25 anymore, and I don't really want to see... <laughs> too much reality you know but I think yeah she there was no friction there was no sort of friction ever around that between us yes No, they have everything they need there. They have doctors who come and go. Um, I th Elizabeth is an extremely strong person, and Vivian is a more vulnerable sort of person, I would say. You, you, know. you definitely get that impression in the conversation about the clothes, mm. that Elizabeth is very... I mean, she's very self-contained, but she's, there's no doubt about what she thinks, and mm -hmm. Vivian is still asking for approval on it. Yeah, absolutely. She's, she has very much her own <coughs> voice through her work, but mm. she's, yeah, I mean, that she's, she's referring, she's often referring to others mm -hmm. for her, for her decision making, her, you know, and, and that's why, I mean, I suppose, she's built what she has around her, so that belies that, you know, she has made that place happen, and made that reality, but she's done that in order because she knows that she can't really deal with everything else, and it yes. needs to be contained. So, yes. in a way, it's a, good, it's a good way of realizing who you are and taking care of yourself, but mm. still within that, she has her sort of darker moments and but no, they have everything they need. I think the spectre that hangs over the film is, is death, yes. Elizabeth's death. Mm. Um, and that's something that they're constantly aware of. Yes. They're there to protect them against intruders, but there's, they're their loving sort of companions as well. But you know, they're, they're there because they're vulnerable to intruders, and which they you know say, they're, they're better they off. They're, they're not that well off. They're, I think they're a lot better off now than they used to be. But I mean, they were doing oh, just okay, but they have a lot more than some people around them. So you know. They, and they are just two old ladies, you know, so the dogs are there to protect them. But they both, they're both kind of emotionally invested in the Right, well, you, you see, when, that's right, when, when um, Vivian starts crying in the film, during the part about talking about going away, um, what then happens is the dog gets a cuddle. So I think, yeah, the dogs are the sort of recept That's Sophie. receptors. Sophie, yeah, yes. and gets a cuddle. So in a way, the, the cuddles that they don't give each other, they sort of give yeah. through the dog, you know, in the way that we might maybe, as adults, don't <coughs> hug our parents, but still there might be some way, you know. And the, the dogs, yeah, they become the sort of transference of affection. Oh, the dogs had that same ambivalence that we were talking about earlier, about being, on the one hand, a protection against the outside world, the sense of them as embattled, mm -hmm. but also a source of um, affection and warmth and closeness yeah. in the uh, interiority of yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you say something?
setting in the house and just so old fashioned and kind of archaic. And then the music seemed struck me as very modern and upbeat and kind of, I felt that there was kind of a personal connection to the music, maybe to you. And I was just, that's just a guess. Mm. I don't know because it's it, I can't really answer it because I didn't think it was looking archaic or old fashioned so to me the time of the music is not necessarily different this the, the it wouldn't be Vivian Elizabeth's choice maybe not could you talk to us a little bit about the choice and what yeah. was going on what you were thinking so, about. So um, I was aware of that piece of music for a while and I was thinking about putting it in a film mm. because it's, to me, the way that it moves through from this kind of piano into this um, sort of swirling kind of house music kind mm. of rousing thing. I just felt that that was very, very cinematic and it mm. could be, if used in the right way, it could be very um, exciting in a film. Um, and I also love the sort of weird lyrics, that is, um, the way that the, 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 the kind of, you know, it's like a very romantic French 80s vibe, I think, to the sort of singing um, and the sort of mannerism about it, sort of exaggerated romantic aspect. I just felt that it really suited this excess, I suppose, of feeling that was in the situation um, and that it would help me carry across that meaning that I wanted to bring through, which is the experience of being there, the experience of being involved in that sort of intensity of feeling mm. that was going on there. Yes. So it, I guess it had been hovering, and I did have a relationship to it in that sense, and it found its place. Elizabeth has a very strong sense of what's appropriate and what's not appropriate, you know, and she did say it was absolutely, when I was leaving, I asked Vivian about paying, uh, giving extra money to the helpers because they'd had to help on the film as well. And she talked to my mother, and my mother said, this is how much you should give, Don Tamar, and this is how much you should give. And it was very clear to her. And this summer, when I was there with my children, a, a German doctor came to see Elizabeth, and I asked him some advice about my son. And after he'd left, Elizabeth said to me, you forgot to pay him. And I was like, I didn't know. I, you know, I was just asking advice. Mm. I you know, so it was, yeah, there's this very strong mm. sense of what's right and what is somebody's role. It shouldn't be overstepped because you don't want to uh, be inappropriate. And... Um, when I was sort of struggling with this idea that I had somehow to deal with the problem of the post-colonial situation of paid indigenous people um, for these white women in, in Latin America, I, I, had, I sort of organized this lunch where everybody in the household would sit down together and eat lunch, you know, in order to see what would happen. And what happened was Elizabeth got extremely pissed off, you know, because... She didn't get to eat until her food was cold because of the camera being set up. Oh. She didn't think it was right that um, people had to come and sit down when they might need to be doing something else or rather be doing something else, you know. And then there was this awkward conversation. It was clear to me that 
she knew the ropes and I didn't actually. And so that was that was important. And I think And you filmed it and it didn't end up in the film. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Because it's not about in the end that was just about my problem my trying to deal with a problematic that's not mine. It's just mm. it's just there. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but yes, it's what what they what she experienced is still what's going on. You know, it, it it's up to date in their world and in uh, many parts of the world. That that's the way the economy works. But there is a way in, in which Elizabeth can continue her life as she was accustomed. Uh, um, in her until she was a teenager, in some way or another, which I think, as well as the kind of tragedy of exile, you also were referring to that. Yeah, yeah. They couldn't afford it. Yeah, they couldn't go back. Yeah. They're well aware of that. Yeah. They couldn't. They couldn't live that way. Um, yeah. Um, any last uh, points or comments? Anyone? No. Uh, Rose, I wondered if you'd like to say something to finish it off in terms of the wider idea. I mean, I, I was struck by the fact that uh, I don't know if this connects with your, um, uh, your interest in the Italian feminists, but the famous slogan that I think was used in the exhibition uh, or event that you were involved with a couple of years ago, Now You Can Leave, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, which is the phrase that the f feminist woman says to her husband at a certain point, now you can leave. And I felt there was an echo of that when Elizabeth says, well, you did kick your husband out. Yeah. Yeah.